The following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Comfortably Zoned Radio. I'm Alan Blumkin, and I'm here with my good friend David Nemec. Uh, We're going to do another podcast today on how... uh, we got into baseball and how we got into the specific areas which uh, we feel an expertise in. And uh, we may be joined by Noel Hine, the author of Once Upon a Time in the Polo Grounds. If, if he uh, comes in, we'll, he'll, he'll participate in this also. Welcome, David. Thank you, Alice. Pleasure to be with you again. Okay. Since you're the, uh, the authority on the 19th century... We'll let you start. Well, it, it's really um, when I, I got interested in baseball. I really didn't know much about the 19th century. I knew it was back there somewhere, and then, uh, I had fantasies. I started collecting baseball cards. I had fantasies that maybe they had cards way back in the early 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 20th century, but I never imagined they had cards in the 19th century. And uh, but what happened was I was given a copy of Turkin and Thompson, the first real encyclopedia yeah. Yeah. Uh, for Christmas in 1951. And I plunged in and I thought, oh my God, they, they, they started professional baseball, made, you know, what was then considered a major league. And I still consider it a major league, the National Association in 1871. And they actually have records of these games and, and the names of these players and where they were born and what way they batted and what way they threw. Some of them. There were a lot of huge, huge gaps. But uh, I was immediately drawn to the 19th century. And uh, later on in high school, my junior and senior year, when I had time to spare in the evening, I started to, because they didn't have the teams. They didn't have rosters for the teams. Uh, you 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 had to construct your own or, you know, try to get them somewhere else. I decided to construct my own rosters for every team in Major League history. And I started with the 19th century. And I realized when I finished, and it took me a better part of two years off and on working during high school, I realized there were tremendous gaps with some of the teams. They didn't have a player listed at a particular position. Uh, and, I, you know, so there there we go there's there's still a lot of research to be done there's still there's still, still things missing and then i found lee discovered lee allen and how lee allen was interested in finding out about these guys and um when i was a junior in high school uh we had to do a, a term paper and i uh approached my history teacher uh who's a good guy and pretty receptive to almost any idea you come up with I said, I want, to do, I want to do my term paper on 19th century baseball. And he said, well, I think you're going to you know, run short here. You might want to broaden it a little bit, maybe take in you know, the pre-Babe Ruth era so that you, have, you get into Kai Cobb and Honus Wagner and so forth. And he said, no, no, I want to just stay in the 19th century. So he said, all right, go for it and see what happens. And I did, and I, I turned in a term paper, and he loved it. And... It stayed with me. Uh, I, you know, I continued to my interest in the 19th century, even after I started losing interest in Major League Baseball uh, when expansion occurred in 1961. Uh, the Indians, my, Cle- my hometown Cleveland Indians, had bad teams. I didn't follow it closely, but I still would, but, you know, and when the McMillan Encyclopedia came out in 1968, I was all in my glory because they, you know, they had all the players and they had updates on their, where they were born, how they batted, and everything, and minute statistics, even batting records for pitchers. So, <clears throat> I went to my cards that I still had from way back in the fifties and started filling out rosters, and uh, I realized there were still some gaps, still some positions that weren't filled, uh, particularly in the nineteenth century. And um, that really took me took over my main major interest in baseball at that point. It was the 19th century. And Al, why don't you why don't you tell us what, how you got into 
particularly the 1950s, which is really, okay. really, really expertise. Uh, basically, uh, you know, my parents had absolutely no interest in it. And I started when I was uh, eight years old, 1951, I started buying the cards. Yeah, I, you know, and, I, and I bought the cards, and uh, uh, I didn't read the backs. The first uh, group of cards I ever bought was a 51 Bowman set. And uh, number one was Whitey Ford, and number two was Yogi Berra. I said, I said to myself, what the hell is, who the hell is Yogi Berra? Well, I found out pretty quickly. And he uh, still to this day is uh, my all-time favorite ball player. So from those cards, uh, they were missing uh, a number of stars, but I was able to sort them into teams. And really when uh, the the thing exploded, when my parents gave me the token Thompson that you mentioned for my ninth birthday in 1952, and then Tops came out with the, you know, the uh, big, what we like used to call in those days big cards, and the Bowman of the Little cards. And the Tops cards had much more information than the Bowman cards. And it was a much more top, complete set, too. Yeah, it was a lot, yeah. good set. Yeah, from uh, uh, the uh, 1952 Tops cards, I learned how to calculate batting average, I learned how to calculate ERA. Yeah, you know, you know that's the extent of my math. But uh, I started following these guys every year, and uh, there was nothing on them. I got uh, a couple of these old guides uh, that uh, came out in the mid '50s, not the the uh, sporting news guides, but uh, the, they were uh, published. Uh, uh, so I have three of the books. I think baseball sure. registers. No, Schiffman. Oh, Schiffman, okay. And then in 1957, for the 1956 season, I bought my first copy of Who's Who in baseball, the Red Book that, uh, unfortunately, yeah. they discontinued a couple of years ago. And uh, that's when I saw all the numbers for all these guys. And, uh, you know, I traded track some of them in the Sunday paper that the Times used to print all the averages for qualifiers uh, in the Sunday Times week, week to week and uh, and the pitchers you know, who had uh, you know X number of innings to qualify for the ERA title and I just could, every year and year I wish I had those some of some of those old cards but uh, it was uh, you know, new players came in, and uh, you know, I was a Yankee fan at that time, and uh, it was ju- it just flowed from that. I started watching the games. I remember watching the first full game I ever watched was the last game of the 1951 World Series, and then I would when I was going to grade school, it was only three blocks away, four, three four blocks away from where I lived. So when they let, let you out, I would go home, especially during the World Series. I'd go home and uh, watch those games. And uh, it just mushroomed. And uh, it was, uh, uh, I found a couple of friends of mine who uh, at that time had the same passion. Well, I, since I have a very, very good memory, uh, I was able to, Process lists and who what certain, who cert, were on certain teams during those years, and uh, it was more autobiographical, more biographical than it was because a lot of these guys on the cards in the early days I never saw. I studied them, and uh, yeah, it's like uh, when Rich Morazzi came out a number of years ago with the from Aaron to Zuverink. The uh, uh, you know players of the 1950s, and in 1958, I started with the Sporting News Guide, and you know there the, was the, a buck, and the paper was a quarter an issue, and uh, so every year it came to renew. Okay, I I ordered the, I would get the Baseball Guide as a premium. 
So that that's how it, it evolved. And I you know, went to, uh, because I was in Queens and the Yankee Stadium was in the Bronx, uh, I'd go maybe once or twice a year, starting in 1955 by myself with a friend of mine. We were 12 at the time. And here we are taking uh, a bus and two trains to get up to Yankee Stadium. Wow. Uh, at the, uh, uh, you know, I did not, uh, I did not like the Dodgers. And everybody in school, nobody was born in Queens, my generation. Everybody was from somewhere else. And somewhere else was either the Bronx, where I was from, or Brooklyn. So we had a very big uh, Yankee Dodger thing. And uh, you know, I hated Jackie Robinson, not because he was black, but because he was a Dodger. And I used to argue that Joe Collins was better than Gil Hodges, even though I know uh, that was ridiculous. But uh, and when the, the Dodgers won the uh, series in 1955, I'd seen the last couple of innings. I ran home from junior high school, and I, when the game ended, you know, I was pounding the, the sofa for a while and screaming, "No, no, no!" Because th- those days, the Yankees, uh, uh, you know, winning World Series was as common as the sun rising in the east. So I just kept up. The, the, I had a big slump in my estrus in the uh, late 60s because the Yankees, this is before the, the divisions, because the Yankees were pretty bad. And the Pirates who was following the National League weren't that good either. But the thing is, is that the games were awful. I call that dead ball era too. And... Uh, you know, when you have a, a situation like 1968, where every game is one nothing, two one, both races are over in June. It's just absolutely awful. I believe the run, the one run that that uh, was scored in the All Star game was came in on a double play. It was I just they had to do something about this, so they brought in four new teams. They lowered the mound. And uh, it, it just got to the point where a friend of mine came in from out of town and uh, wanted to know if I was interested in going to a couple of ball games. I said, no, i got to go to the racetrack. Yeah. Yeah. That's how fair yeah, it is. Yeah, but once the uh, the division split ha- happened, and well, I didn't like the LCS. I, you know, I, I didn't like any explained the playoffs. But they they lowered the mound and the hitting, you know, perked up. And uh, uh, the Pirates got good. They won the series in 1971. I was in all four games in Baltimore for that. And uh, uh, my interest came uh, came slowly back. I uh, also would get the Street and Smiths every uh, baseball digest. All the stuff that they they had back then, which give you, you know, March was the prospect issue, a baseball digest. They give you all these prospects, and you know whether or not they could make good. And in April they would come out with their season, uh, you know, the season opening issue, which had all the rosters, and uh, it just got to be, uh, you know, very very. Uh, Good with me. I managed to pick up uh, uh, the the guides from 1957 on back for about $3 a piece. And an early card show, I picked up the Who's Who's from 1956 through 1945. Uh, another card show for about 2 3 dollars a piece. So uh, uh, I missed the uh, guide, even though the uh, baseball... America has a thing called the Almanac, yeah. which is it's good, but it's you know it's organized differently. And yeah, uh, uh, then the uh, but the register or whatever uh, they discontinued all that after 2007, and yeah, it's been pretty is hard. A great book. Yes, now because everything is online. 
Yeah, yeah they make it very, that. very difficult, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And my interest didn't come back until uh, until the mid '70s. Started to come back. The Indians were a little better, and also I spent as much time studying Macmillan as I had the Turkin and Thompsons, and realizing that Macmillan came up short in a lot of areas too, and uh, started reassembling my teams and my rosters, and still finding you know gaps in the 19th century. And uh, writing to people and saying, and who admitted, yeah, there are gaps. There's still things we don't know. And it fascinated me. And I, and I started, uh, I got into writing about baseball in the back door in a sense, because through the back door, because I started writing trivia books, quiz books. And uh, they perked up, uh, I realized I got a, tr- a good, great response to them. And they really perked up my interest. And I started getting interested more in the modern game. But uh, when I joined Sabre in 1986, I went back to the 19th century uh, because I was meeting people who actually were interested in the 19th century. Previous to that time, uh, if I asked, a, if I were to ask a trivia question about the 19th century, people would just say, throw up, your, throw up their hands and say, okay, move on to when real baseball started in 1901. But uh, for me, real baseball started way back in the 1840s. Uh, teams started forming. Uh, they, they were scheduled games. There were lineups posted. Uh, there was there was a fan interest, and definitely it came to full into full bloom in 1871 when the first professional league formed, the National Association. So I started imagining myself writing other books besides trivia books, and I did get involved in the ultimate baseball book. I was hired to do the historical sections, and because I knew the 19th century, nobody else they interviewed did. I knew the inception of the game. I could I could write about that. I knew enough about all the decades after that, so that um, I would, you know, I did a, I did a, I think is a fairly good job in providing history all throughout baseball up to the time uh, the book was first published in uh, 1979, and uh, at that. At that point, um, I began to see that I could do other kinds of baseball books. And I, I put together uh, great baseball feats, facts, and first, and uh, a couple more quiz books. And then I started really plunging into the 19th century and doing a history of the American Association from 1882 to 1891 when it was a major league. And that book came out of the Beer and Whiskey League in 1994. Yeah. And it led me, to, by that time I'd done so much research that I realized I could do I could do an encyclopedia just on the 19th century. And I did do one that came out in 97 and has been reissued uh, by the University of Alabama Press and updated. And that uh, is fairly complete. I've got the, I've got the complete, fairly complete rosters for all teams. There have been a lot of things that have, a lot of, there are a lot of new discoveries every year. Uh, names change, birth dates change, death dates change. Uh, sometimes statistics attributed to one player uh, are revealed to actually belong to a player nobody even heard of before uh, who had the same last name and nobody knew that he was not the player uh, uh, with, with the same last name who was playing on, the, on in the league at that time. So uh, I, did, I did the uh, alternate baseball book and the uh, Beer and Whiskey League and the, and the encyclopedias that led me to do uh, books solely on the 19th century players, owners, mm-hmm. managers, umpires, and league officials. And that, was, that came out uh, in 2011, 2012 as a, uh, Major League Baseball pro, Profiles, uh, 1871 through 1900. And I ended it at 1900, although I did do full bios for players who only played briefly in the 20th century uh, who had bios uh, nowhere else. Uh, I did put bios for uh, players like, I think, Earl Beck and uh, a few other players like Irv Beck and uh, a few other players like that. But they were, you know, I did, you know, when I had a lot of help on it and um, among among eight or ten of us all together who finally worked on the book, 
we now have a compilation of all biographies of all major figures and most most of the minor figures who played um, uh, Major League Baseball in the 19th century, and that's the that's the achievement I really uh, um, you know gave me the most pleasure and the most enjoyment in doing. And I've also since done a historical baseball novel set in 1884, and that was a pleasure to research. Writing a novel is never fun, particularly uh, the first draft. It's always a challenge. And uh, when I sat down to do the, do the first draft, I realized, okay, now, now the work sets in. The pleasure's over. Fun, fun has ended. But uh, I still uh, consider the 19th century area uh, my, ma- my major interests, and I'm always happy to respond to questions, talk with people about it. Uh, I, gi- I give lectures sometimes, uh, do readings on some some of my 19th century material, and uh, I, it, all together it's thoroughly enjoyable. And I, I know you did the same with a lot of your 50s guys, particularly Yogi. And yeah. Uh, well, oh, I mean, uh, as a Yankee fan, the, the two most upsetting movements for me were when they sold Rashi, the Rashi to the Cardinals in March 1954. I'm eating dinner. I'm, I'm uh, not even 11 at this point. I was 10. And it comes over the radio that the Yankees have sold the Rashi to the Cardinals. I was up all night crying. I couldn't believe they did that. And the other one, which I had, uh, I, I never broke out in tears over a trade after the or a sale, was when they made Gene Woodling who had a bad year in 1954, was injured a lot, and Irv Noren had his career uh, year where he hit 319. So when they made the Yankees made the trade for uh, uh, Bob Tully and Don Lawson, they included Woodling instead of Noren, and Noren went back to his 260 hitting, and after 56, they sent him to the A's, which was the the end ground for most of the players that the Yankees sold, sent over there. And uh, uh, Woodling had uh, several really good years with the uh, Indians. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was great to see him come back. He'd been with them in 46, and they had dropped him. And uh, toward the end of his career, he came back and, and gave them gave them a real show. And they didn't well, have much else. The story I read was that uh, Stengel uh, either managed him or managed against him in the Pacific uh, Coast League in 1948. And when Stengel was hired by Weiss to be the manager, he said, "I got this guy in the you know in the Coast League that can hit almost anything." So you, you can pick them up cheap. So Weiss put up whatever the money was, and uh, they, they got them. But, uh, yeah, so that's a, you know, when players belong to a team back in those days with the reserve course, you have players belonging to the same team for a long time, about nine, ten years, whatever. And, uh, uh, so you got they became almost very personal to you. Yeah. Now one, when one of them, uh, you know, one of these something happened to one of these guys, uh, you know, they get traded or whatever. Uh, they, uh, you know, it, it bothered me. So anyway, I, I got the best. Finally. I had a couple of stories. I never, I spent nickels and dimes on Topps 54 cards and 55 cards, and Mantle was in either of those sets. Especially, really? Yeah, because he, he was under contract to Bowman. So you know, I'm not the only one. There are plenty of kids that spent a lot of money looking for those Topps Mantles that didn't exist. And now there's a there's a million custom cards out on that. But, uh, uh, you know, so I got really interested in uh, the uh, Topps Bowman Wars that ended uh, after 1955 when Topps bought Bowman out because you had a number of players 
that was signed up with Tops, another place, another place that was signed up with Bowman. So it got to be, and then finally in 1956, it all went under one umbrella. So yeah. that, and the last year I bought cards as a kid was in 1959. And uh, my mom, we had a house, I kept the stuff in the basement. And when, whenever the new season came around, my mother made me get rid of the old ones. Really? Made yeah, oh, yeah. Threw them out? Threw them out, yeah. Hey. Yeah. Well, I never had a 52 mantle because that was yeah. Tom's mantle because that was a, a set that was released very late. Yeah. I didn't see most of them until I bought the reprint set in 1983. And uh, so, I, so all the number of these all Bowman and Top sets were reprinted. So I, I bought the reprints. Uh, so I, so I says, "Well, you do it." I'm not looking to sell these. I'm looking to look at them every once in a while. So, uh, and Tops, the last re, uh, set that they re, re, reprinted was in 1994, and then when the, st the strike happened. That year, I, I think the interest in uh, baseball cards took a big beating. And uh, what's really strange about the hobby now is that Mickey Mantle's been dead for 25 years, and he's still number one. Yeah. Think yeah I mean, the, the, the five players are the top, hitters are in the top echelon are Busio, Williams, Mantle, Mays, and Aaron with Frank Robinson and Clemente just below them. And the hitters are worth more than pitchers. Yeah. So, but that's how uh, yeah, every year, uh, every year, a uh, bunch of us in school would buy new baseball cards because in those days they didn't come out to March. And, uh, you know, we, then we start trading. You know, I trade Mickey Mantle for Ed Fitzgerald, if I did, Ed Fitzgerald. They didn't have any value back then. No, they didn't. They no, didn't. And, and uh, then uh, people decided to, that they could make a business out of this yeah, in the early 70s. Yeah. That's where card shows started, and the prices uh, you know, just get driven and driven up. Uh, I took my nephew to a uh, card show in the... Uh, Great Neck, that's where they lived. My parent, brother lived at that time. Uh, and it, it was incredible. This is only like January or February of 1995. So we go into the card show. And he, 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 he squirreled away. Uh, he got gotten bar mitzvah the previous year, and he squirreled away a, a pretty decent amount of money. That parents never found out about. Mm -hmm. So he goes in there and he buys a 75, I think it was 75, a rookie Eckersley for 75 bucks and a rookie Winfield for 150. And he's whipping out $20 bills like I used to whip out nickels and dimes and quarters. Yeah. Right. I just sat there. I just looked at that. I said, uh, yeah, uh, I couldn't believe it. And there's another kid looking at the same stuff uh, he was at at that point with a magma magnifying glass to see whether there were any bumps or flaws in the card. Yeah, it's amazing how that... It, 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 it became crazy. insane. But, yeah, uh, yeah. so my interest, uh, my real interest... Basically, from the end of World War II, 46, to the end of the Yankee dynasty in 1964. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't know if you uh, remember this. Uh, uh, in the 50s, Sporting News occasionally run ads uh, to send the dollar. Uh, and uh, it wasn't through the Sporting News. It was a private collector, evidently. And uh, you would get 10 cards from... Uh, sets in, a set from the early 1900s, and you wouldn't know who you were getting. You'd just get 10 cards. Uh, 
I would see these ads and I would say, well, what kind of cars did I didn't even hurt? How could they put bubble? Did they even have bubble gum in there? Really? You know, they they do? By tobacco yeah, companies. Yeah, they sold them in tobacco cars. I didn't know that. Yeah. And I unfortunately um, kept thinking, okay, I'm going to do this and just see what happens. But I never got around to do it. But I've talked to guys since, met them, who did do it. And they have vast collections from the early early uh, 20th century. And, of course, we've all since learned that there were tobacco cards in the 19th century. Uh, yeah, I and there were, there, were, there were cards of obs- really obscure players, minor leaguers. Uh, you, you know, and you would get cards. You would sometimes get cards with a loaf of bread. You would get cards with... Uh, you know, all kinds, all kinds of. It wasn't just cigarettes and tobacco, and uh, as a result, uh, you know, I never, I never got into it. But I know that I, w- I wish I had in retrospect, because those tw- uh, 19th century cards are something to behold. They were, they were really good representations. Yeah, they were actual true. photographs of the players, and uh, some of them were staged. And, a lot of those uh, sets have been reprinted. Yeah, mm-hmm. re- but the, yeah, of course the reprints are knockoffs, and I know they're not they were, and, knockoffs. Yeah, yeah, but, not, you, but they're still you know, they're still, sell them anyway. You got no, no. So no, and no. The, the first major set of the 20th century was the T two o sixes. We had uh, like four cards of Cobb, four cards of uh, Speak. You know, all the top players uh, at that point, except for. Uh, Wagner, who you know didn't want, who pulled that out because he didn't want the kids smoking. That's why that T two O six Wagner, uh, you know, held the uh, number one spot for years until the fifty two Tops mantle. Yeah, it's still. And I don't know if you if you uh, you were, this is probably, might be before your time, but I I had. A card of Honus Wagner, a 1949 card. Uh, I can't remember the name of the company that issued. Leaf. 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 Yeah, exactly. I had a lot of the a Leaf card stop with Hasbro, players Hasbro, Hasbro the, with it. That ball was with missing it. at that point. Uh, yeah, Leaf has Wagner with uh, a package of chewing tobacco in his hand, reaching, <laughs> you know, reaching into the package. He's going to put a plug in his mouth. At that time, it was a pirate's coach. So yeah. there you go on Wagner and, and tobacco. As far as you know, uh, I don't know what you know. What is real? You know, is, uh, he, is, he may have disdained tobacco in his in his playing days, but he certainly he certainly came to it in later life and had no problem, uh, you know, doing a complete reversal on having him, himself represented with tobacco in his hand on a baseball card. Yeah, they. And, the second place uh, card in the T06 is also a Hall of Famer. For one reason or another, uh, uh, discontinued. There was Eddie Plank. They discontinued Plank. I guess, you know, back in those days, a player could refuse. Huh. I have a couple of those cards. I'm gonna have to look and see what I've got. I may have a plank card. I don't think so, but well, this is just um, one. It's just the one. With the hmm. Wagner, there was one. With the plank, there was another funny story. Uh, uh, was uh, uh, top six uh, signed uh, Ted Williams uh, to a five-year contract in 19, from 1954 to 1958. They got him by paying him the extravagant amount of four hundred dollars a season. Yeah, well, and, that was that wasn't chump change in those days for most ball players. Yeah, and so anyway, uh, when Bowman put out their set, they had a Ted Williams card in it, and uh, when Topps saw that, they sued to make Bowman stop the card. As I say, I had the exclusive contract with Williams. Bowman stopped the card. They had to stop the card. I mean, the real ones of that card are very, very expensive. The Bowman mm. card. And so anyway, when 
uh, Pops went to reprint the 1954 set. They had uh, they had uh, uh, Williams had two cards in there, the one and the 250 last card, first and last cards. Except when they went to reprint this, they didn't have the rights to Ted Williams, which was owned by Fleer at that point. So they had to pay Fleer an arm and a leg to uh, you know, get permission to uh, print those card, reprint those cards. So Fleer gave them, and they reprinted both cards. They threw in a, uh, a Mickey Mantle card. Uh, and uh, so, you know, when the Tops bit, bit, bit Bowman in the backside in 1954, they got their just results. Hmm. Results in 1994. It's funny how things yeah. work out sometimes. Yeah, but, it uh, is. I, yeah, yeah. Huh. But anyway, I, I don't, getting yeah, back to I, you, I found your first two trivia books. The ones that came out in the 70s. In a used bookstore. Barnes and Noble. Yeah, 76 and 77. Yeah. Barnes and Noble uh, had a bookstore on 18th Street and and, uh, uh, Broadway that had used books. I found them there. And I was able to get some of them. I mean, my knowledge at that time wasn't as good as it is now. And the one I got, you said that by that's this one. It was the player at the time, the last player to have 200 RBI seasons in his first two years. That was, of course, Ray Jablonski. Yeah. That was yeah I know that. Alley. It's happened a couple of yeah. times since. Yeah, uh, it's happened since. Yeah, I know Wally Joyner was one of them. Uh, yeah. And uh, so anyway, and then uh, you came out with a couple of other things. And then uh, I remember when, I, when Steve Nadell told Scott Flato that you were coming to the convention in 91. Scott went crazy. He took the phone call and they called me. I went crazy. And I, I called Steve back. I said, don't you know who this guy is? And that's when we met. Yeah, and that, was, that, was, that was a great time. I, I, knew, I knew you guys' reputation, but of course I didn't have it. Yeah, I wasn't living on the West Coast at the time. Yeah. And trivia on the West Coast wasn't nearly as sharp as it had been when I was in New York. And uh, I was pretty much alone. Uh, you know, I, did, I would give the trivia test a quiz at my chapter meeting sometimes when I went. But uh, then when I got to New York and was put on a team, uh, and we were pitted against you and Dick and Tom and Ken, uh, you know, that was really the most challenging yeah, that was the one trivia of, event I'd ever participated in up to that time, maybe the most challenging ever. Even the, uh, even though we lost uh, the final, I had my biggest moment in my whole history up there. When uh, somebody says who's the last, last whole, St. Louis Browns Hall of Famer did two home runs in a game. So I reasoned out that uh, it wasn't successful to a successful because they wouldn't be asking that question of himself. And so that left two part, that left Bobby Wallace, who was not exactly a long ball hitter. And I yelled out, right, right at the end, I yelled out, Branch Ricky. And uh, Scott said, right, this, I got standing off for that. It was the best signal moment I had in uh, my whole uh, you know, career of yeah. playing. I remember that, and I, yeah, I didn't know who who had, who had answered the question, but I remember hearing it, and I said, "Oh my God, that's going to be right," uh, and of course it was, and uh, you know it was um, there was a, but that, there were some great questions in that uh, trivia contest, you know, and one was right up my alley, and nobody else had a clue, I don't think, who was the last left-hander. In the, to win 30 games in the national in the season in the National League, and so somebody on your team jumped on Carl Hubble, who never did it. 
My love. And I was I was scrolling through my mind, going back, 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 and and I you know just before probably the time was just about to run out, I suddenly came to Frank Killen, and who I think did in '96, and uh, I said Frank Killen, and that was the way, and that was the that was my shining moment in that that trivia contest. Wow. Uh, it's uh, it was a great contest. There were a lot of good questions, and uh, and you ran you run contests and contributed questions, which were always great. Uh, I really enjoyed I them. Remember after Milwaukee, uh, yeah, well, you asked me what were mine, and you say you were so big. I said I only won from the best. Yeah, yeah. You you, you yeah. basically taught me how to construct questions as I got. Deeper and deeper into the writing part of it, uh, I learned that you know, construction uh, uh, was the best because I, I ran a, uh, uh, a test a quiz at my uh, local chapter here. This was right after they started giving corporate names for ballparks, so I threw in a question about that, and I got such a bad reception on that <laughs> that I never asked one again. No. Okay, and the other time uh, when uh, we were in Toronto and somebody asked me if that was over, uh, if that was over, why I didn't ask any LCS or LDS questions. And I said, because nobody cares. Yeah. yeah and uh, right. I found out that you have, when you're doing something like that, you have to give the audience a, a they have to have the audience feel that they have a shot at it. Yeah, you gotta get, you gotta give one clue that that somebody who has real expertise can use and can take and run with. And uh, you know, if you just have who hit what when, and you know, uh, and that that doesn't that's not really a good question, even though the answer might be somebody nobody, you know, is rather an obscure player. You have gotta give something in that clue. That will steer somebody in your audience, give them a fair chance to get it. Okay, and, one, uh, one I gave, but the, the, there were six Phillies who were there in 1950, who were still there in 1956. I said two of the uh, two of them were the Hall of Famers, Robin Roberts and Richie Ashburn. So you know, some people did well on that, some people didn't. I gave them the two, and the others were Del Ennis, Ray Hamner, Hamner, Woodenhead Jones, and uh, Kurt Simmons. Yeah. Yeah, which which is a fair question, because anybody who does know the history of the Phillies in the 50s, they were the, go, they were the go-to guys in 50, and uh, most of them were still the go-to guys in 1956. They were, they were you know, they were the the core of the team. Yes. Uh, uh, how about like the old Dodgers, the old Brooklyn Dodgers, the same core for, uh, you know, for, for years. And that's what, I don't know how, uh, it's it's very tough to me to be a fan of a team these days because you, can't. you don't know whether somebody will be there from one year to the next. You can't ask questions like that anymore. No, You, you can't ask who are, who are the six guys on the, you know, 2010, uh, you know, Red Sox who were there when, in 2016, you know, he, no, nobody, I mean, nobody gets it. Because, you know, it's just, the it, it team's got such turnover every year. You can't really find a player to root for and stay with for, it's, uh, you, you can't follow your team from spring training through the end of the season into the next season because everything's changed around and, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's not the same, and I, you know, I'm I'm just going to speculate publicly right here and now that I don't think there's going to be a season this year, and it will be the first time since 1870 that there is not what I know, I've I've said that, a major, not an actual consider, you know, major league season. But, uh, and it's unfortunate that uh, it's come to pass as it has, but it, it's well, my uh, Pittsburgh friends. So you know, a 60-game schedule where you've got 60 innings as they qualify 
for the ERA, about 190 play appearances to qualify for the titles. And one, one yeah. friend of mine says they shouldn't, if they pull this off, they should not give any awards at the end. MVP, no, Cy really. Young, whatever. And uh, no. I, so I put down, I said, the, the National League had 60 game schedules in 76, 77, and 78. Yeah. Yeah, because they only well, they only had sixteen seven yeah. seven and seventy eight. Well, and, they had eight uh, the first time before they kicked out uh, New York and Philadelphia. New York and Philadelphia, yeah, they were playing with teams in Worcester and Troy and you know, yeah. Providence. Yeah, well, uh, Worcester and, uh, became the Phillies. Syracuse. And Troy became yeah. the Giants. Yeah. Troy became the Giants in eighteen eighty. Yeah. I I just I, I just I just want to say. Uh, one more thing. We have to wrap this up in a couple of minutes. Everything I've learned about the 19th century has been through you. I have the Beer and Whiskey League. I, I was able to find a copy of the uh, your first edition of the 19th century encyclopedia in the downstairs at the Strand Bookstore in New York. This was a several days before it was actually issued. I remember telling you that. Yeah, yeah, and, right. And uh, I have the second one, and I have uh, that uh, biography uh, set of uh, yours in uh, the that came out in 2000. But, uh, so, uh, so about the, to me, you are the authority on this era. Um, well, thank you. Just yeah, thankful. Yeah, yeah. I know you. And, yeah, it's it's, it's a passion that still exists and will continue. I'm, you know, always ready to talk about it and always ready to find. It. And there's there's plenty new, plenty to be discovered. You people know more about 19th century baseball today than they did in 1950 because there's so much, you know, so much more access to arcane uh, papers and uh, all kinds of stuff on the internet. So anybody who's really interested in the 19th century and uh, knows how to knows how to search uh, can really find a lot of interesting material about a player or a team or an event or a, or a park, uh, almost anything you dream of. Uh, somebody somewhere has either written a blog about it or has written something about it, and that. Uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's a, it's a minefield. You never have to leave your house. And that's, yeah. that's what makes, that's what makes where we are today bearable for, uh, people like me and Al, because we can, we can just, we know that we can go online and we're going to have, uh, a treasure trove in front of us of things we haven't seen before. Well, uh, there's a man, Ralph Horton, who, uh, we, reprinted all the guides, both the Spalding and the Reach, uh, from 1876 through 1907. I have them all. Yeah. And it, yeah. it, it, it even included the 1890 Players League. Exactly. And, and so, uh, uh, you know, so I, u- I use that a lot. That seems to have the year-by-year averages. Uh, it does. They're not, they're, not, they're not always accurate. Yeah, but, I, well, uh, yeah. But the, the, they, were, they, were, they were considered accurate at the time. There have been many, 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 many changes in stats for 19th century players, and in, that's, this, that even existed into the yeah, early Yeah, I don't even remember, remember what he charged for this. It was like $20, $30 of an issue. And to me, it was worth it. Yeah, it was. It was. I, got, I bought a lot of them, too, and I got a big box full of them one time. I just, you know, I got them all at once, and... You know, okay. Ralph, just... And I, I knew I, I knew Ralph. I didn't really ever meet him, but we talked on the phone and corresponded, and uh, I really told him how much I appreciated what he had done because it saved saved everybody um, because most of these most people don't have any original guides from the 19th century. I have a couple, but uh, I'm fortunate in that way. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, to uh, our listeners that uh, I don't know the current availability of this, these things, but uh, that they are out there. Yeah, okay. so anybody who's interested in 19th century baseball, if you look me up and uh, 
um, if I can answer anything or help you with any uh, research, just you know, I'm not that hard to find. So. And the same with uh, me for the same with me for the 1950s. Yeah, Al is absolutely you know aces in the 1950s. You know, almost nothing I can ever think of I can get past him in that that decade. So it's been a pleasure once again, Al, to be with you. I'm here. Look forward to doing it again soon. Yeah, I give my best to Marilyn. I will. Thanks, Al. Okay, take care. Bye bye. Bye. The proceeding has been a comfortably zoned network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.